very special occasion because, as you know, this is the lecture for Mustard by Kat Sandler. And Kat Sandler is here today. So, Kat, thank you for coming. So, um, there's lots of lively conversation in the room about this play that is very, very touching and uh, very beautiful. And I was just speaking to a woman who also said it really feels profound. So um, anyway, uh, I'm so glad that you're all going to get a chance to see it this afternoon. And today, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Tom McGee. And he's the co-founder and associate artistic director of Theatre Brouhaha. He's a dramaturg, playwright, puppeteer, and producer. He's also the co-creator and artistic director of Shaky Shake and Friends Puppet Shakespeare Company. So I guess you do Shakespeare with puppets. Yes, yes. So with Shakespeare as a puppet as well. Oh, okay. okay. So he, he's got a role. And he adapts and performs Shakespeare for young audiences. Tom has been the dramaturg and occasional co-creator of an award-winning, of award-winning playwright, Kat Sandler's plays, most recently Liver, Retreat, Punch-Up, and her newest play, Mustard. Tom also works as an independent communications consultant, focusing on media and presentation training with an audience-centric focus. Recently, he worked as an arts consultant on John Tory's successful mayoral campaign. Tom has a master's degree in theater studies from the University of Toronto and a B.A.H. What is it? Oh, that's B.A. Honors? Yes. Okay. <laughs> B.A. Honors from <laughs> in theater and classics. He also runs a nerd blog, I really like the sounds of this, whathappened.ca, where he analyzes modern mythologies and a podcast that analyzes sequels, in brackets, please sir, I want some more, available on iTunes. So welcome, Tom. Thank you. Oh, what? What I forgot to say is that I asked Tom whether he would like to talk and then have questions and he said that if you have questions, something really pressing, for sure, ask it as we go. And if he needs to yank back the lecture to his agenda, he will. <laughs> so uh, anyway. I will definitely do questions afterwards as well. But if there's anything really pressing that you just, as, as an audience-centric person, if there's something that's really bugging you, I would like to address it at the time. Uh, so thank you for the lovely introduction. That's a lot longer uh, spoken aloud than it is on a paper. Thank you uh, for sharing that. Uh, with me. So, um, thanks so much for coming out in the uh, blistering cold uh, to join us here today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, theater in the age of content, and basically a little bit about what it's like working with Cat, what Cat's process is, and also uh, what Theater Bruhaha does, and what we've dubbed the HBO generation. Now, obviously, Mustard isn't a Theater Bruhaha production. It did start in one of our development labs, um, and I think basically anything you see by Cat, as, come on, you guys. Um, anything you see by Cat tends to have these tenants in them. So. Who knows, maybe you'll see them today. Um, but yeah, without further ado. So, what kind of theater are we making? Who are we making it for? How do we go about it? These are the big questions that, of course, come up, particularly when creating new work. And with us, a lot of this had to do with, again, what we've come to about the HBO generation. Before I get into that, uh, just a couple words on who we are and uh, how Kat and I got working together. So, um, Kat and I went to school together, and we worked uh, on a bunch of different projects in a bunch of different capacities. Uh, we were, were part of a children's touring children's theater company. Uh, I was directed by her a bunch of times. She wrote a commencement speech. But our professional relationship didn't really start uh, until we both got to Toronto around 2010. So Kat was trying to sneak two short plays into a, uh, it was a contest or a festival that required one one hour long play. She had two half hour long plays. So she asked me to come in and take a look at them and see if there was any way we could sneak this past the adjudicators. Um, in taking a look at them, there was a lot of connective tissue between these two plays. The first one was about a, based on a true story about a girl who sold her virginity on the internet. And the second one was about a guy who, still feeling the hurt from his biggest breakup, orders a lifelike sex robot of his ex-girlfriend, only to discover that it may in fact be her getting elaborate revenge on him. Um, as you do. Um, so, in looking at these two pieces, what uh, Kat and I discovered was that there were a lot of connective tissues. These characters could, in fact, be the same characters. The girl who sold her virginity could, in fact, be the sex robot girl in the same way that her jilted ex-boyfriend in the first piece could be the guy who orders it in the second. By finding those, we were able to combine it into what became our first play, Love, Sex, Money. And this was kind of the first time that Kat and I had sat down with her work and figured out what value I could bring to it. 
Um, what I tend to do and the value I tend to bring is something I've dubbed the dramaturgy of first audience. So dramaturgy is a very broad term and no one's really defined it properly. I can't, uh, <laughs> nor can any dramaturge I've ever talked to. Um, the best way I can describe what I do is essentially try and be the first audience member on any piece. I try and come up with all of the things that you might think or ask or question about after the play. Essentially, I'm trying to guess what will come out of the theater saying, you know, I really like the best friend character, I don't know why there wasn't more of them. Or, why didn't that one plot line get resolved? Or, I really enjoyed the humor, but I could have done without whatever theme, whatever plot point. Um, so, in doing this, we try and put audience right at the very beginning of each of these processes. Because ultimately, uh, one of our big fundamental beliefs is that if we're developing a script, it's not for us, it's for you. Um, if our script, we, we don't like to sort of sit on scripts for very long, we want to get them out in front of people because really, seeing the reaction, seeing the response from an audience is what tells us what's working and not working in a script. So that's generally what I try and do and try and be in room with Kat. Uh, I also operate as a sounding board, uh, often a theater therapist, uh, as well as dealing with the balance of audience needs versus audience wants. Um, those may seem like the same thing, but what we often find, and I've certainly experienced this myself, is you'll go, you'll see a movie, you'll see a play, you'll read a book, and you go, oh, you know what, I, I really wish it had had a happy ending, or I really wish it had had a sadder ending. And sometimes that's absolutely true. Sometimes, though, we only want that because we, we were so connected to it that we felt that that, you know, oh, if only I'd had it my way, would have been great. But sometimes it's more satisfying to have the authorial intent deliver the proper ending to a story. There have been a ton of TV shows where I've gone, oh, I really wish so-and-so and so-and-so -so had ended up together, but, you know what, I'm kind of glad they didn't. You, you told me a, a more interesting story because of it. I had a better experience. So that's part of what I try and balance is the audience needs versus the audience wants. So, why? Why are we doing the kind of theater we're doing? Well, it all starts with us being told repeatedly, and I'm sure you've heard this too, that theater is dying. It seems like every other day someone is saying that theater is dying, declaring it a dead art form, someone just did in England. It happens all the time with budget cuts, with funding, with decreasing audience numbers, all the other content available to us. People are constantly telling us that theater is dying. So we start thinking about why that is. And for us, a big part is that our generation, uh, which is roughly the 20 to 30 somethings, aren't going to theater which really pissed us off at first, because we're like, well, we go to theater, we work in theater, but then we really looked at what we do in a day, we don't go and see nearly as much theater as we should. So we started thinking about why that was. Why weren't the 20-something young professionals not going to theater? What was, what was going on there? Well, we started by looking at ourselves and looking at what we liked and what we think about. Um, so we started thinking, okay, well, what are we watching? Now, this was back in uh, 2010, 2011. So HBO was just really hitting its stride with a full slate of new programming. Uh, True Blood had just premiered, Entourage was going strong, AMC was just coming into its own, Mad Men had been running for a couple years, they just premiered The Walking Dead, Breaking Bad. And we looked at these kinds of shows we were watching that we were excited about, we started thinking, okay, well what, what is it about these pieces, what's really drawing us in? It was strong characters, plots, they were fast, they were edgy, they had great production values, they were slick, and more importantly, they gave us something to talk about. You know, we go week to week or we binge five episodes and like, I can't believe Walt did blank! Um, and so we start wondering how we could transition that into theater, if that would perhaps start to draw our generation in. Another thing that we were noticing was often lacking uh, in stage was the experience of being, uh, we're slightly pre-millennial, but we remember the pre-internet, the post-internet age very acutely, and we weren't seeing very much internet on stage, we weren't seeing much technology on stage. TV and film have kept up with technology very, very well. But in theater, even though there have been some great, impl uh, great implementations of technology with projection and everything else, we weren't seeing the reality of a post-internet age reflected on stage. For instance, anyone who has a teenager in their life who's constantly glued to one of these <laughs> knows that portraying you know, a 14-year-old in the year 2016 who doesn't ever talk about their phone doesn't quite sync with the modern experience. So, we noticed that for our generation, maybe that was part of it, that we weren't seeing what was interesting or exciting or just part of our daily reality on stage. So we wanted to add a bit more of that. Um, what we found since then is that the HBO generation has started, and we dubbed this, sorry, we dubbed this group the HBO generation. Because we're like, okay, these are people who were a little bit young when HBO was really starting out, but kind of came of age of wanting that darker, deeper content right around the time that HBO hit its modern stride. Right around the time that HBO? Oh, uh, HBO is the, uh, the home box office network. So it's a TV network. They've done um, Rome, The Sopranos, uh, Sex and the City, um, True Blood, what's on out, Game of Thrones. Um, and basically, they're a premium. Angels in America. Angels in America, yeah, they do a lot of great TV movies. 
they're essentially a premium uh, television channel, and as a result, because they have a premium attached to it, they have very, very high production values. But that also gives them the freedom to tell very big, sweeping stories. I mean, they, for Rome, they physically rebuilt Rome on a soundstage, and it looked beautiful, and it had movie quality production values on a TV level. And I think, no, of course. And I think what, what really hooked us about that is we were seeing what we liked about movies told over 80 hours rather than over three. Um, now, the HBO generation has evolved a bit. It's 2016. Netflix has really hit hard. And as a result, uh, they've kind of, in a way, become the Netflix generation now. Whereas HBO was offering high production value on a weekly basis, Netflix <coughs> offers the ability to self curate your own content. With Netflix, if, you're not, if you have access to thousands of TV shows, thousands of movies, and you can pick whatever you like. Whereas before with the TV channel, you're sort of at the, the whim and whimsy of whoever programmed the channel. With Netflix, you are programming your own channels. As a result, people are getting really, people are becoming experts at what content they like and don't like. Whereas before, maybe you'd watch a show on TV because, oh, well, it's on, I guess it's fine. With Netflix, I've watched people watch four minutes of a show and say, nope, done with this one, I'm starting a whole other series, and they're gone. And then they're off and they watch 25 episodes and, you know, show up the next day and they're like, okay, through season three, let's talk about it. <laughs> um, so all of these factors were at play on the audience that we wanted to see in the theater. And part of the reason we wanted to, to see this audience in the theater was we knew they weren't coming. And in order to keep the theater ecosystem healthy, we wanted to make sure that these young professionals who were just developing their cultural habits were including theater in their cultural habits. So often, we can t I can turn to any of my friends and say, hey, there's a band that I heard is maybe good, playing down the street, it's $10, do you want to go? People say, sure. You say, hey, there's an incredible play that I know for a fact is wonderful down the street for $10, do you want to go? And they're like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, and that's what we're up against. So we decided to go after this demographic hard. This is a demographic that all consumer-driven companies are desperate for right now. One answer. Um, which is the young professional, just developing their cultural habits. More importantly, for the very first time, these folks have disposable income rather than income just for their necessities. So really, if we want to make sure that these people become the eventual patrons and donors of theater, we need to get them now when they're just developing their habits. In the same way that getting kids hooked on reading when they're young will ensure that they enjoy reading for the rest of their life. Um, so who are these people? Well, they're people like me. <laughs> they want to be entertained. They like dark, fast, edgy, funny content. And they want to see their reality reflected on stage. Um, Kat has very famously said, oh, famous for me, perhaps, uh, <laughs> twice, that we want our theater to be uh, the kind of theater that either gets you in a fight or laid in a bar, or more recently, the strange character you meet in a bar who tells you a weird story and then you talk about him for the rest of the night. We want our theater to carry over beyond simply the curtain going down. Because that's the one thing that theater can really offer, and the fact that you're all here is proof of this. Something that theater can offer that film and television currently can't, except at big festivals like TIFF, is the ability to actually connect about it, to actually talk to the playwright, the director, the actors, the dramaturge, whoever, there's a real ability to create an experience here. And so we want to make sure that whatever theater we're putting out for this HBO generation is exciting enough that when the play ends, they don't walk out and say, what was the play about? Oh, I don't know. That was good, though. We want them to be like, oh, man. I, 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 we watched one of our plays, Delicacy. I actually watched two couples. It was a play about couples. Two couples get into a very deep argument about the nature of marriage and relationships because of the play. And on, uh, on the one hand, I hope it worked out for all of them. On the other hand, <laughs> I think one of the greatest crimes uh, of any artistic endeavor is being forgotten. Is, is it being too temporal? And just, again, that, that idea of like, oh, I saw a play. Yeah, it was good. I don't know. Some people were in it. it some guy named after a condiment. Is that some place named after a, a spice? I don't know. It's good. <laughs> and that, that happens. Uh, and that's really scary to us. Yeah, so we know our audience has those fears. Um, we know that um, the young audience often thinks of theater as a long, boring thing in a dark room where they can't talk to their friends. It's going to take off their whole night. They need to get dressed up. It's going to cost $100. They have these fears, and part of our job is to allay those fears. Uh, we like to, uh, Kat saw a few grand movie once uh, where we talked about units of time, and we've just stolen that and kept it nice and close. The idea is that in any given day, you have units of time, and those units are very valuable because you can never get them back. So right now, you've chosen to use a unit of your time that comes to me, blather at you, and I very much appreciate it. Uh, you're gonna use another unit of your time to see the show tonight. You used a unit of your time to get here, so, if I'm planning my evening and I know I only have so much time, let's say it's a Friday night, I'm excited to see my friends, I want to have time to go get food, I want to have time to talk to them, to chat, to go get a drink, and if the play takes up the whole night, 
I don't get to do any of that. So that's going to make me real hesitant to go. It's part of the reason people like sporting events and music, because they can talk while they're watching it. So we're very, very time conscious. Uh, Mustard is a slick 90 now? Yeah, 90 minutes. So Talking during music? At a, uh, sorry, at like a, a more so in a bar sense, where, you know, there's someone oh. playing, yeah, certainly not in a concert. <laughs> Otherwise it's chill. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I believe the TSO has snipers for that. <laughs> Especially when you say at school, I think one of the things is when poetry and theater in school, it is dark and boring. Mm -hmm. And they read Shakespeare, or they read plays, but they don't see plays, they don't know what they're, you know, they have no idea what plot theater could Absolutely. That's one of my goals with the Muppet Shakespeare Company is that so many of my friends who hate Shakespeare now, hate it because the first time they encountered it, was as awkward teenagers who were scared of all the things they should be scared of, you know, they getting it right, getting it wrong, it's strange language. That's the first time a lot of people encounter Shakespeare, and that can set you up for hatred for the rest of the They don't see modern plays. They've been playing through all, like, 500 years. Exactly. Period dress. They're not going to understand it. It's going to be very long. It's going to be, like, who knows? I'm going to enjoy it. So our goal is, no, 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 forget that. We want we want this particular this audience, look, we're going to do something fun, fast, edgy, that looks and sounds like the things you like, and that's theater. We're going to get you in and go. We basically want to prove that theater isn't film's broke cousin, which fast unfortunately food. a lot of our generation <laughs> tends to think. So it's fast food? Uh, not necessarily. It's food that comes out quickly. Um, but it's, I uh, think of it more as efficient food. So if you go to a restaurant and you sit down, you have a lovely conversation, you get your menu, you order, and it takes an hour for your food to get to your plate, even if you're having a lovely conversation, you're sitting there going, I just, you know, we've got things to get to, where's my food? Similarly with us, we, if it were fast food, then leaving and not remembering a thing would be totally fine with us. We want you to come in, have a great experience, leave wanting more, but also going like, wow, great, and I still have... You know, I have time to drive back to Mississauga. This is wonderful. I don't have to rush for that last train. Yeah. Um, I remember at high school, at the, the first Shakespeare play that we did was As You Like It. Oh, And it was done by the Wolf and Barrett Company. And as a class, we went to see it. Mm. And that kind of thing happened later with the Glasgow Citizens Theatre. Mm. There was communication between the Educational Authority mm. and the theatre. And I know Stratford has done a lot of that here. Part of the problem that's, that's coming up now is with increasing class sizes. The cost of getting students to the theater mm -hmm. is getting almost prohibitive. And Stratford is doing everything they can to... Yeah, but that's not an answer. That's not a valid um, reason, because Canada is a very... Uh, is a vast country. Mm -hmm. It's a rich country. And it ought to be giving subsidies so that these uh, teenagers can, can go. I agree. And, and furthermore... Furthermore, um, uh, we had an experience at Christie Gardens with a group of high school drama uh, uh, creator um, students, right? And they were in their teenage years. And the depth of understanding that those teenagers had, and an 82-year-old was absolutely <laughs> thrown away it, 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 by this kind of, and it was because Creative juices were being um, created, but in our culture, they were being nurtured. Absolutely. And that's part of our, our goal, to your point about subsidies as well, is if we can get the current generation excited about theater, right? know, to know that they're, because I mean, like, I was touched by theater as a, as a young OB lad, and as a result, that's, that's why I'm involved. Same thing with Kat. I mean, uh, theater matters, I think, in a huge way, otherwise, none of us would be here. Um, and Part of our goal is that as particularly my generation starts to get older and starts to make those laws, make those subsidies, we want to make sure that theater is super important to them. So it becomes a priority, not, and I mean Trudeau is a great example of that as a former drama teacher. Uh, the guy likes theater, which is great, it's a great first step, but um, it's important that in the same way that legislation supporting sports is very well kept and well mm -hmm. Loved. If we can make theater exciting and important for those people as they grow up and start to make the laws, they'll carry it with them. Yeah. Uh, but absolutely, absolutely valid points. Um, and so that's and actually to that point. The other thing we're running into now is that uh, people don't treat theater the way they treat music or film, which is I, we have a ton of people we've talked to who said, I saw a play once and I hated it, so I hate theater. <laughs> they don't understand that there's genres, they don't understand there's different types. I've seen a ton of theater that I hate, but it didn't stop me from coming back in. The equivalent of saying I listen to a Kanye West song, now I hate all music. But people do this, and so part of our job is to show them, wait, you, there's a lot of different forms of theater, and you may actually love period pieces. 
You just haven't seen any that you like yet. Mm -hmm. But you might hate them, and that's okay. You might like dance pieces. You might like collective creations. All sorts of different things. So that's what our goal was, was let's create a company and a working model that will allow us to try and show our generation the theaters for them as well. Which brings us to, oh, I missed a slide. HBO generation, everybody. Uh, so that brings us to Theater Bruja, uh, which has led to typos for all ages, um, including me registering our first email account as Brohaha. Uh, which we don't talk about anymore. Um, so Kat and I determined that this was the kind of audience that we wanted to go after. Um, Kat's a compulsive writer, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So we knew that she could punch out plays and that we could go that way. But part of the issue with being a young writer, um, anywhere really, is waiting for your work to get picked up. And that's something we didn't want to do. So we decided that um, we both had some experience running theater companies. Uh, we decided to risk big um, on our first show. So for Love, Sex, Money, Kat basically took her life savings, put it up, and we rented a theater and did the show. Um, and it worked beautifully. Uh, we, in, part of it was that we incorporated a lot of business into our theater. We didn't just want to do a show, we wanted to build a company. We didn't just want to pop up some ideas that we felt were interesting. We wanted to put this HBO generation audience member right front and center. And with Love, Sex, Money, as a company that was completely unknown, we kind of flew under the radar for a lot of theater audiences, but the HBO generation showed up in droves. Uh, we had a group on, which is an online uh, group, group on, and it's group on. Uh, for Valentine's Day that sold hugely because literally people were like, I need something interesting. I want to be the person who has planned the interesting, exciting date. Oh, there's this slick looking piece of theater. Oh, that sounds, oh cool, yeah, people never do this. I'm gonna do this. Um, so that was really interesting to us. And one of the things that I'm most excited about with having Mustard here at Terragon is now finally the traditional theater audience that's been the lifeblood of theater for years is finally gonna get to see some of the stuff that we've been kind of doing off in our little corner of the world, which is very, very exciting. Um, so, we, now that we had all this in mind, uh, we had to figure out uh, how to go about it. So we knew we were aiming for the HBO generation, um, and we needed to ensure that the content we're creating is exciting for them, and of course, that's not to say that all the work we'll ever create is, will be specific before the HBO generation, but starting out, this is who we want to target, and it's kind of led us down an interesting path, I and mean, a good one. It's not to say all audiences can't enjoy it, just we feel it's very important when creating new work to pick a specific audience to reach for, um, because you rather risk being too general and then everyone's dissatisfied rather than being specific and really serving one group and having uh, others find it as they will. Um, so, uh, we needed to first, of course, come up with an idea. So, Basically, here's how Kat and I always start out on these things. Um, Kat will usually come to me with the writer's issue, where she'll say, I want to write something. I've got, a, and I'll basically turn around and say, okay, well, what's interesting to you right now? And we'll basically just sit there and chat about the things that have kind of hooked into her brain as interesting ideas. And basically, her interesting curiosity collides with my random accumulated knowledge of wasting too much time on the internet. Um, and generally, we'll just kind of shoot ideas back and forth. She'll say, oh, I'm kind of interested in this. I'm like, oh, there's an interesting thing about that. Uh, I was just reading this piece in the walrus about blah, 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 blah. She's like, oh, that is cool. And we'll basically hash out a bunch of those. My job in those early encounters is basically to be brain fuel for Kat, to just dump interesting stuff on her sort of creative fires and see what takes off. The problem is that it doesn't really matter if we think it's interesting, if our audience doesn't think it's interesting. So we could, I could very easily do an entire lecture on Star Wars, but that'd be interesting to me, not necessarily interesting to you. So, no matter how excited we are about an idea, if Kat and I can't come up with a reason that our audience, particularly this HBO generation audience, would be excited or interested or engaged with it, we just won't do it. Um, and this is kind of what I think has set us apart a bit with the development of our scripts, is that this is where we introduce the audience. Not at the end of the play, not at the first read, but at the very inception of the idea. We want to make sure that audience is present throughout, so that we don't lose sight of who we're really making. So, it's not me, it's you. Um, so, we then take these ideas and we start to dissect it further to see what the greatest appeal to our target audience would be. Uh, so, for example, things we often think about are like, what's popular right now? What are people talking about, posting about? What are people reading about? What conversations are you having over and over and over again with different people? Um, how many times do you call yourself saying, like, oh, it's funny, I'm just having this conversation with someone the other day. Those are the sorts of ideas that we want to grab and play with because that's what's exciting right now. The other risk, I think, that um, in the age of content is that new content drops so quickly now that it can be very difficult to write a topical play. 
Uh, one of the places that uh, improv actually and sketch comedy really, really thrive is in being able to address things immediately. If there's a newspaper headline this morning, they can have it up on stage by the end of the night. Whereas with theater, often an idea that would have been really on topic a year ago is already passed out of the, the uh, modern zeitgeist. Um, we often include pop culture references in our scripts, and jokes that would have been funny a year ago aren't funny now. So the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge was the most viral video of 2015. If we made that joke now, people would be like, oh yeah, oh yeah, that thing, I guess. <laughs> um, whereas if we had a Drake joke, We'd be on point right now. Um, so the most recent example uh, of this was we were approached by the Coffer Center for the Arts to do a podcast. Um, Serial uh, is a podcast that uh, National Public Radio down in the States has put out that people are very excited about. And the Coffer Center wanted us to create a podcast for them. Given that that's journalistic and we're narrative writers, we instead looked at what makes Serial popular. Part of it's being able to binge it, part of it's mysteries week to week. What's strange is as people have moved into the mode of wanting TV that they can stream for five straight hours. In audio land, they're oddly satisfied waiting a week. It's, it's a very strange phenomenon. It's, radio has come completely full circle with the advent of podcasts. Um, so as a result, we built um, a story that's now on episode three called uh, How to Build a Fire, which is about sort of small town witch hunt, paranoia, supernatural thriller thing. Uh, it's wonderful, and you can get it on iTunes. Um, it's also in Now Magazine. Uh, but basically the idea there was, okay, people are talking about serial, what's interesting about serial, how can we apply that to an idea we're excited about? The idea we were excited about was a video that went viral a while ago about uh, a town where you could light water on fire. Uh, there was so much waste, waste gasoline that a guy turned on his tab, held a lighter up to it, and the water burned. Which we thought was a crazy interesting idea, but it still had to link into what people were talking about, what people were excited about. And this particular mode was when they were, and uh, so far it's been getting a great reaction. Um, so weirdly, before we've even written the script, we turn to summaries. So we look to TV guide sentences or elevator pitches. And basically the idea here is that we want to set up a mantra for ourselves right out of the gate that we can constantly come back to. Uh, our play Punch Up that was uh, out a couple years ago was very successful. Um, the pitch existed for that play about a month before the script started. It just gave us something to keep coming back to. In that case, it was the funniest man alive, or sorry, the saddest guy in the world kidnaps the funniest man alive to win the heart of the saddest girl in the world. <laughs> we had that. We're like, okay, that's what it is. We can work with that. We can pitch that. But also, we know that's what we're selling to our audience. We know that's what our audience will be excited about. So let's keep coming back to that. Um, do, 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 do. Right. Um, so. In these cases, Breaking Bad has always been one of our, our go-tos for this because the pitch for Breaking Bad is extraordinarily simple and very to the point. It really helps tell you as an audience whether or not you'll be interested in the show. What is it? Uh, well, so this was a show that came out on uh, AMC about six years ago now. And the premise is that when a chemistry teacher is diagnosed with cancer, he and his worst student starts cooking and selling meth in order to try and raise enough money to take care of his family after he dies. Um, and it's great, that tells you all you really need to know about whether or not this is a premise you want to buy into, a story you want to buy into. Uh, Love, Sex, Money is the play I referenced earlier. Again, a girl sells her virginity on the internet, prompting her jilted ex-boyfriend to buy a sex robot that looks exactly like her. Simple premise, you'll know whether, pretty much, out of the gate, whether or not you want to see it. Uh, Cockfight, one of our plays uh, from two years ago now? I don't know, somewhere along the way. It's about three hard luck foster brothers who buy a fighting rooster and try to train it how to fight, but end up fighting each other. <laughs> Retreat is about a bunch of uh, bloodthirsty corporate interns who literally fight to the death for an entry level position at a large corporation. <laughs> Simple, straightforward lines, and as we continue to develop the script, we keep coming back to those to make sure that we're keeping it on point. <laughs> so, Cat's process. Um, Cat's a compulsive writer. She actually gets really twitchy if she isn't writing. She's probably bothered by not swooping right now. Um, so basically, uh, once an idea has taken root, Cat uh, tends to go to Dark Horse Coffee unless they feel and just install herself there. Uh, if you enjoy mustard tonight, uh, you can thank the unofficial sponsor, Dark Horse Coffee. Um, so she basically installs herself uh, there for days at a time. When the coffee shop closes, she either moves to a bar or home. Um, and by doing this, she puts herself in a situation where she's away from all the distractions. And because, I mean, ultimately, we're trying to develop theater for the age of content, but we also live in the age of content. And she could easily blow the day watching funny puppy videos if she didn't keep herself in a 
controlled environment. So what happens is she'll sit there, and generally speaking, um, Kat can punch out a play anywhere. Uh, I think the quickest was three days ish. Well, one day. Yeah, one day. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, that one. <laughs> uh, so generally, Kat will sit down, and she'll just punch out a bunch of stuff over the course of the day. I'll get a late night phone call or email saying, "Hey, I've got some pages to look over." She'll send them to me. I'll read through them with my audience cap on, looking for all those things that, again. I think that if I were in your shoes, I'd be like, well, hang on a second, or, oh, this is really exciting. I've never seen a play that uses an imaginary friend this way. More about the imaginary friend, please. Um, so we'll chat a little bit. Of, generally, she'll have an idea of where it's going, or she'll have questions about where it's going. We'll chat a bit about that. Uh, we have another dramaturg we work with as well, Daniel Padgett. We'll generally kick it between the three of us. And then Cat will run away, write a bunch more stuff, kick it back to me. And this generally goes on uh, until we have a first draft. Um, our first draft leads to something that we inadvertently uh, came to call the brouhaha, which was basically our way of getting a bunch of different brains and a bunch of different points of view on a script very early in its development. So rather than waiting until the draft has got polish on it and is well set up, we just jump right into it. Originally, this would involve Kat making a giant pot of pasta, we get a bunch of cheap wine, and we invite a bunch of our actor friends over to read it and then give us feedback. Um, as a dramaturg, I've worked with writers who don't even want to show me their first draft. So this is a very raw process, but it gives us the advantage of having a bunch of people who we trust, who know our work, who know our goals, reading our stuff right away. Also, for Kat and I, it's wonderful to get to just hear it rather than reading it in our own voices. There are lines and ideas and concepts that sound one way up here, and then you hear them out loud, and you're like, oh, no, that was, that was not what I intended. Um, and sometimes it leads to wonderful breakthroughs. Sometimes it leads to huge cuts. Um, and basically, this is how we're dealing with workshops. Um, as an indie theater company, we don't really have time or money, with particular granting, to run workshops. Uh, also, to keep our work as fresh as it can possibly be, we want to get it up on its feet as quickly as possible. So what we've essentially done is folded our workshop process into script development and rehearsals so that it all happens at once, rather than workshop, script development, play. Um, so this is the first step of that workshop, is an early read. Generally after that, um, Cat will run away, write a bunch more, we'll kick a few more drafts around, then we'll get either the same people or different people in, get it read again, kick it around some more. Um, but there's two important things going on here. One is that there's a bit of a writer's room approach, which is wonderful. We have uh, the benefit of having actors who've worked enough with the text to say, listen, when I was playing this character, here's what was bothering me, which is an audience perspective of all of its own, really, uh, which is fascinating. But there's also uh, something that uh, I definitely like to flag about uh, the importance of having a benevolent tyrant in the room. Because one of the problems with getting a bunch of viewpoints on a piece is that you can really bog it down. You have people who are like, wouldn't it be more? It's like the reviews you read that are like, if I was writing this play, <laughs> Hamlet would be set on the moon. Um, you run the risk of really diluting a product that's really in its very early phases. So you do need to generally crack down a bit. And the nice thing is, because Kat's always the prime writer, she's able to just say, thanks everyone, we're good. And off and work some more. Uh, so generally we do about two or three of these um, and then the script is further revised in room and that's definitely been true with Mustard as well. Um, once the, the cast is in place they really help shape and stamp it. A lot of people say that our stuff often looks like it was tailor-made to the actors and that's because it kind of literally was. Um, a lot of times actors bring in their experience, uh, their, both their life experience and their professional experience really helps us hone each of the parts to be as good as it could possibly be. Uh, the first overhaul usually comes right after casting. We have a, a first read. Uh, we burn through a ton of paper. <laughs> Everyone brings their scripts in, writes them down, hands them off to us. We run away. Um, usually take about two days and then flip them almost a new script with their feedback. Uh, our play Liver, uh, which opened last year, the entire structure changed after the first read because we hadn't decided as a writing team who the main character was. We had a bunch of characters we were very excited about. We put it in front of the actors and incredibly, one, one of the actors, one actor basically was like, it's about this guy. And everyone was like, yeah, 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 don't make it about me, it's about this character. And that really helped us hone where it was going, what it was about, and then they all started throwing in their life experience, which really helped clarify things for us. So really, it's a very, very valuable point, and it's great because actors spend so much time thinking about plays that you basically got a series of professional academics at your disposal. So we love uh, making use of those. It's a very stressful process, but it's ruthlessly efficient, and it often means that we can bring in actors who can afford otherwise because we're only taking up three weeks of their time. Um, for example, Liver was a month from first idea to opening, uh, including rehearsals and writing and drafts and all that jazz. So 
Once we have that in place, we switch back to the image. So the pitch comes back. We're again thinking about how we're going to get it out there. Because frankly, no matter how cool our idea is, if we can't get you excited about it, what's the point? Uh, I know tons of people who have told me about fascinating plays that I never heard about. I'm like, I would have loved to have seen that. I just never heard about it. Um, and so a big part of that for us is the image. So HBO is very good about making very slick posters. The Breaking Bad poster tells a really engaging story. Having Brian Cranston in his tidy whiteies with a gun in the desert. I mean, even if you don't know that it's about cooking meth, that's an interesting image. We know something interesting is happening there. Um, so we wanted to make sure that the HBO generation was seeing images and concepts that were similar to what they already knew they liked. Uh, so, for example, Punch Up uh, on the left there is about um, the play I referenced earlier about the famous comedian who gets kidnapped by his biggest fan. So we had uh, our pal Colin Munch chained to a typewriter and t uh, Tim Walker punch away on the keys. It tell you may not know what the story is, but you can tell that something's going on. Help Yourself uh, is about a con man who convinces you to do the bad things that you want to do. So we want to tell that in a very clear, kind of devil on your shoulder way. Um, liver is the play I was just talking about, about a guy who wakes up on a slab in the middle of an autopsy, missing his liver, uh, and realizes that he could live without it. Unfortunately, he's an alcoholic, and everyone that loved him has left. So it's about him trying to find meaning in this hospital room, um, often by trying to date increasingly younger women. Um, so we kind of wanted to make sure that each image grabs you enough that you have something to go on, that it isn't just name of a play, good luck. Um, so that was a big part of it, because frankly, we believe, and I, I certainly believe, that your experience of the theater begins the minute that you hear about something. So you, you, your experience of mustard has already begun long before the curtain goes up at 2.30 from the first time you heard about it, whether it's because you heard of Cat, or because you're a regular subscriber to the Tarragon, or you saw an ad. Whatever that first point of contact was has already started to shape your experience. This lecture will shape your experience of what you're going to see later today. What you had for lunch will shape your experience of what you're going to see later today. How comfortable the seats are, how bad your commute was, how expensive the parking is. All these are factors that as artists we don't like to admit are part of the experience, but they are. How cold is it? <laughs> How cold is it? Exactly. But uh, as a member of a theater art audience, as soon as the curtain goes up, mm -hmm. you go into another world. Mm -hmm. and, and so that, what you have just said, ought not to have any relevance. Right, not necessarily when you're watching it, but I think in terms of, uh, think about a play you've seen that costs too much. Because I've had this experience where I went and saw a piece and I was like, well that was fine, but for that amount of money, think of all the other things I could have done. And that alters the way I view it. Uh, I had a, a, a professor who used to review at um, Stratford, and what, what he got down to, which I thought was fascinating, is that he judges all plays and prices based on how many performers are in it. So he's like, if I paid $50, <laughs> and there were 50 performers, I was paying a dollar per performer. That's okay. If I paid $100 for a one-person show, it had better be a great show. Um, and I think I, I agree that the play itself, once you're in it, should you shouldn't be thinking about those factors. But even things like crinkly candy, uncomfortable scenes, those are the sorts of things that we do Feel. And that's part of the reason why we like coming in at, at 90 minutes, because we're like, we know that people are going to want to either get more beverages, use the bathroom, get up and take a, take a walk, stretch. We know all those things are part of your experience, so we need to make sure that we're keeping those in mind while we're creating our work. Yes? I'm a subscriber here, and mm -hmm. the only reason I heard about the play is because it's on our, our yearly subscription. Um, I would imagine that you would be using now mag, now mag uh, newspaper to get across but I've never I've never heard and I'm I look for stuff mm -hmm. to go to I've never seen any of these plays advertised before right so, I'm not your target audience mm -hmm. however well we still love that oh, <laughs> uh, but it's interesting yeah well part of that is that um, what's interesting with the way we ha we ended up having to market these is that um, Based on our budgets, traditional advertising is generally outside our reach. So to run, even just to run a piece in Now Magazine, an ad in Now Magazine, is outside our financial reach because all of our, all of our pieces end up being profit shares. So every dollar that we spend is one dollar less that gets split up amongst 20 people. people. Yeah, amongst 20 people. So word of mouth is your best thing? Word of mouth is our best thing, but also digital. So because part of the reason that the HBO generation works so well for us is that through Twitter, through Instagram, through Facebook, we're able to get these images out. Um, so Facebook allows you to set up a profile picture for yourself as well as a banner at the top of your screen. And one of our early tricks was that we would take an image, we take, we get our graphic designers to cut up individualized banner images for each person who's in the play. 
So all of a sudden, on any given day, rather than saying like, hey, I'm going to play, come see my play, it was like, whoa, what's with that crazy girl holding a liver on your page? What's going on? Um, if people are wishing someone happy birthday, our advertising is showing up in their feed. So that's generally how we get a lot of these out. Um, also, postcards are still the, the most cost-effective form because we just print a stack and we leave them. When I go to see a newsletter company or I see something, I, I go home right away and I go onto the computer and I'm very literate with it. And, and then I go on their website and then I start getting mail from them. Right, yeah, so absolutely. And I know, so now I know about this that I didn't know before. For sure, and that's one of the things that's so exciting about being at Terracon. And even though it isn't a Bruja production, strictly speaking, the fact that Cat is involved means that all of a sudden, weirdly, we have bigger reach than we've ever had. Uh, through this piece. Uh, same thing with this uh, radio play. Suddenly we have the ability to, to anyone, anywhere can listen to it and it's free. So there's nothing stopping people. And finally my uh, grandmother in Alberta gets her own brouhaha piece <laughs> in Edmonton. Uh, yes ma'am. I was wondering, I've never watched or heard anything about Cat Radio. Mm -hmm. Is this considerably older than the pre-millennial generation, etc.? What I really would like to know is how inclusive a demographic are you reaching? Because everything I have seen, every photograph, everything, they're all white. Mm. Yeah, so diversity is something we've struggled with, absolutely. And I think across the theater spectrum, right now, particularly in Toronto, you're going to see that. There's a couple reasons for that. Um, in indie theater, uh, one of the most exciting things I've seen, at least, is that I can't keep, I've got a, a friend of mine who was uh, who's going to be my Hamlet in Shaky Shake. I can't keep him employed at the indie level because he's getting snapped up. Uh, he's Asian Canadian and just he's, and he's a wonderful actor. So he is immediately gone. I got him for one play and it was a wonderful play. Um, we've, uh, that's something that we've been working on, we've been struggling with. Um, and it, again, you see it across the atmosphere. Part of that is that you'll notice a lot of the same faces are showing up in a lot of these postcards. Same white faces. Same white faces, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And they, we, basically we cast a lot of the people that we've cast are friends of ours, who have been friends of ours since we couldn't, we didn't have a name in, to draw in people, now we do. Um, our next, one of the ones that we're working on this year actually is a very diverse piece. Um, and that was always the goal. Um, part of it is our process is so insane that if we have three weeks, we're going to grab someone we know. And a lot of our friends are white. And, you know, particularly coming from Kingston. But if your goal and your audience, your target audience, is predominantly the people of a certain age group who are very much, surely, that is a broader spectrum. It is, absolutely. It, it's an incredibly broad spectrum. But we, uh, and again, it's, it's an issue we're, we're working to fix, and unfortunately, I don't have a particularly good answer. Um, we're, at the end of the day, we both, uh, for as, as, as great as Bruja has been going, and as well as we've been able to capture the HBO generation, at the end of the day, Kat and I still can't pay ourselves salaries. We still have to work day jobs, we still have to do all of the things surrounding the theater, and as a result, there are issues that I would love to spend more time sorting out that we just haven't had time to get, which I know is a, a terrible answer, but we don't. I don't have women answer. get that kind of situation. <laughs> Fair <enough. laughs> um, but uh, it's definitely it's definitely a concern, and uh, something we're looking at. Um, to your point about but at least you're aware of it, and you're working. Oh, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Yeah, they, uh, there have been a lot of discussions, uh, particularly on social media lately, about diversity in theater and what that means, uh, particularly at the indie level, um, and also, I mean, particularly with everything in the news, it's, it's impossible to avoid. It's one of the great questions of, of the day, but. Anyway, um, yes, so we're working on it is the short answer to the long and the familiar one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, that brings us to the future then. So, what does the future look like? Um, part of it is reaching larger audiences, part of it is being able to reach out into different demographics, to work with different people that we haven't had access to previously. Um, and Tarragon is a huge, huge, huge first step for us. Mm -hmm. This was always a dream of certainly of cats. And, Sure, of most playwrights. Um, but really, at the end of the day, no matter what demographic we're going after, our biggest goal is to tell a good story. Um, and if we haven't done that, then we haven't done our jobs. Um, there are a lot of things we're excited about. There's a lot of issues we're excited about. There's a lot of ideas floating around that we're really excited about. But at the end of the day, we want you to be entertained. We want you to have a good experience. And that goes for any demographic, no matter how we've reached you, how you've heard about us, whether you accidentally stumbled into our theater, or whether someone forced a podcast on you, or whether it's part of your subscriber package. We want to make sure that you had a good time. Um, and a good time doesn't necessarily mean that you love the play. You can walk out of a play going, you know, I, I hate that play, 
It was a good play, though. Like, it was well put together. You know, everyone did their work. It just wasn't for me. Totally fine. And that's completely acceptable. I feel that way about a lot of things. Um, and I'm sure you guys do, too. Uh, and in this particular instance with Mustard, uh, Mustard's a pretty exciting one uh, to get to tell because it's based on a very personal idea that Kat's been carrying around for a long time about her own imaginary friends when she was a kid and how they related to her father and her father doing the voices of these imaginary characters. Um, but that alone isn't enough. That's not enough to just put that on stage. What we found instead were all of the ideas and issues that hopefully you will see identified and enjoy in Mustard. Um, and that's kind of where we went with that. So, uh, all that going to say that in the age of content, you have so many options. Anyone who's carrying a cell phone right now could watch any number of TV shows, movies, HBO content, AMC content. You could go to the movies. You could go to you could go to any number of places. There are two plays happening in the building. But you have options, and so in order to stand out, we need to be the audience's champion, and that's true from the minute we come up with the idea all the way through. So, uh, thanks for listening to me blather at you. Uh, let's open up uh, some questions. Yes. I just want to say thank you so much for the emails after we uh, do the, see the plays and we can score them to our friends. We love coming here. The quality of the theater is phenomenal. And I've talked about quite a bit afterwards. And it goes, oh, yeah, the turn on it's great. But as you say, to get people So, if that email is great, I'll pass that on. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. I'm a Terragon subscriber, and the reason I love it is because I used to go to Can Stage too. Mm -hmm. They have a heart here. They, you, you are somebody. You're not just a name, and and they treat their their subscribers very well. Okay, now this is directed to Cat. Um, I, in the last 15 years, not necessarily just a Terragon in all theater. Let me say first that I'm not a crude, and I wonder. I've always wondered, I've come out of some of the plays and thought, what was the writer thinking when there are so many expletive words repetitively, mm -hmm. and that after a while it got really annoying, and that I always thought that one here or there really packed a punch. Again, I'm not a prude, but I wasn't alone in that, and I've just noticed in the last 15 years or so, that a lot of the plays, every other word. Well, and I, I think I can speak to that. Um, one of the patterns that we've noticed, and this was part of the representational thing in terms of our generation, was um, generally speaking, I find my generation is extraordinarily foul-mouthed, myself included. For sure. Um, Without even yeah. synonyms, it's boring. Sure. It's like <laughs> there's, there's more, I think there's a little more to it than just, oh, we like swearing, because swearing is fun. Swearing so often, I know particularly coming out of my mouth, is often a replacement for um, er, um. <laughs> it's literally a thinking thing. And uh, from a purely linguistic standpoint, swear words are the easiest ones to form in the English language. So my brain just goes to those. So I will often sit there just, like, if I'm sitting there thinking, I'll be, and I mean, Kat can attest this, I'll just be dropping F-bombs, and it's not because I'm, you know, using the word in my kind of way, it's just, literally, that's where my brain went. And that's true of a lot of my friends and a lot of our, our demographics. So when we're trying to put our demographic on stage, that's something that, to our ear, we don't even register. But the lack of it is something that we do. Um, so we try to be careful not to, although from the sounds of things, we, we weren't successful in your particular case. No, we, I have never seen anything oh. that you've done. So well, get ready for something. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few, though. Hey, actually. <laughs> Mustard is actually one of, uh, one of the uh, uh, idiots who use a lot more sparing than, than mustard than, than Did I learn anything? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, and is it because you're good and angry that you use those words? No, no, not at all. It's that if for, for whatever reason in my generation, I find, uh, often it's literally just thinking. I do use them when I'm good and angry, but what's funny is I actually get more eloquent when I'm mad because I, I want to get the rage out. Fornicating is also an F word. There you go. Right? It's got three delicious syllables. It's so much longer to say. <laughs> Shows Usually, for this generation, uh, swearing, or the F word, as you say, um, is very common. And in fact, I went to see the other play here at the Tarragon, uh, Wednesday matinee, which happens to be student matinee. Okay. And the audience, there were a hundred kids sitting in front of me. The language was their language. They were identifying with, they were so excited. For them, this was relevant theater. It was speaking to them, speaking their language. 
it was so exciting to see. I was thrilled because whenever I go to the theater, I know that there are going to be people of my generation, which is wonderful. We're all here. But <laughs> what about the younger group? What about these people? How? This is one way to reach them. I'm not saying we have to do it and say, uh, come up with, with uh, swear words uh, gratuitously. It's got to be relevant. It's got to be speaking for them in a way that they can relate to and is meaningful to them and to the play. Mm -hmm. In That's the pub, there's a book unfortunately. So Shakespeare is full of swear words? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I've seen um, this already. Mm -hmm. And um, there are times when it may be a word that some of us would prefer not to hear, and yet it works perfectly in the context of the story. And that's certainly what I found, and you may as well be prepared now, because you're going to hear some of those words. <laughs> but the very first time it's, it's said is just so perfect in its timing and in getting a personality across that it doesn't matter if it's a word that's overused or anything else. If it's used appropriately in this particular show, Spot then on. it's fine. And that's right. what I think about yeah. the show you're going to see today. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I had to um, let it go in one year and hurt the other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tom, I, I'm so fascinated by, by what you're saying, and I love this idea that the audience is in your head from the start. So my work is in audience education, audience conversations, dialogues. So when you're creating the play, do you have a vision about what audience talkbacks, conversations, dialogues look like for the HBO generation? With how, how does the whole of the evening look? Like I know you're, you've got to get someplace else after your next <coughs> minutes. But could you spend 15 or 20 minutes staying in the theater for a drink, Absolutely. a conversation? What does it look like to you? Well, part of the, the 90 minutes thing, the, the other place you need to get to might actually be the exact same place you're in. It's that your brain wants to shift gears into the next part of your evening. So in this case, getting to talk. Uh, a lot of the work we've done has been at the Storefront Theater, which is a converted mm -hmm. pharmacy mm -hmm. at Ossington and, and Bloor. Um, and they do great. Uh, basically, uh, a Q&A at that place generally looks like everybody stays in the lobby afterwards, gets a drink from the bar, and just waits until the actors and everyone filters out, and all the conversations happen there. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of, I but, find... But is it a focused conversation? No, it's or not. Is it and, a casual... Well, and part of the problem with the focused conversations is that a lot of the indie sphere lacks people like you. Um, we don't have people who are dedicated to running these things in an effective manner. So a lot of Q&As, um, and I mean, I'm sure we've all been at Q&As that are just very, very cut and dry. You don't really gain any insight. They're just there. Um, and they can be very frustrating. And I know that if your first experience with theater is in high school, often you're like, yeah, I'm on a field trip, but oh man, you're gonna hear, you're gonna talk about their wines again. So a lot of the conversation ends up happening oddly out of the theater altogether, either in a very casual sense, and one of the things I do is I can drop a ton, because that's huge audience data for me. Um, but a lot of it happens on Facebook. We see huge conversation threads begin on Facebook where people are writing essays to each other in response yeah. to plays. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Ossington uh, Blur experience was more storytelling than it was theater. Mm. Yeah, well, with, um, these guys were a theater company here in the city, uh, Red One, and they basically were looking for space to do one show, so they're doing it Wait Until Dark um, uh, three years ago now. And they, um, so they found this old abandoned pharmacy and they rented it. And uh, now they've, they've painted it and they, you know, it's, it's, we still hear the neighbors from upstairs and they sure hear us. Um, but it's a, it's a wonderful space and it's enabled a lot of people who can't. The funny thing is that people, it, it, people often think that it's, it's money that's preventing people from renting an excellent space like the extra space downstairs. It's not, it's availability. I mean, there are only so many shows, if you're looking at a two, three week run, that you could fit in a year, and often one week isn't really worth the time to gear up and everything else. So as a result, even though we have a bunch of amazing theater spaces in the city, they're booked, like, you got to book, it's like booking a wedding venue, you've got to look way down the road. So something like the storefront is a very uh, useful and necessary tool for a lot of younger companies that are like, they can only afford one week, and I can't get into their spaces. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Well, and it's interesting because even, even theater. Fringe theater. at this point, uh, the lottery is so huge that a lot of companies really do end up having to self produce. But yeah, we love that we've done, uh, we actually have a play coming up in Fringe this year, uh, featuring uh, a bunch of Fringe mainstays. So. Shameless. 
Oh yeah, sorry, the, uh, the Toronto Fringe is a massive, um, it's one of many uh, national festivals where you enter a lottery, basically pay your $600, uh, you give them a check, if you get in, they cash it immediately, they draw something like 150 names out of a hat for various categories, and after that you're on your own. So you can do whatever you want on stage, if you just want to sit and stare at the audience for an hour, you're welcome to do that. Uh, you really get, it's a fantastic microcosm of the business of running theater. You have to be an entrepreneur, you have to be a marketer, you have to be a developer, a designer, producer, you have to do, we're all hats. It's a wonderful festival, uh, rolls around every July. So check it out if you have it. Um, any other questions? We've got about five minutes left. So if anyone has any Yes. I've got one. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to come back to the age of content. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, I, I feel that, okay, we're bombarded by stuff, but mm -hmm. actually there's very little content. <laughs> and um, it kind of ties in with your process. Um, so I'd like to get your take on it because I wonder, you know, when you got this very interactive process, um, organic process for actually writing a play, what, how do you get meaning? Well, often. Are you actually starting with some, you know, values or? Well, generally, yeah. Generally speaking, when we're analyzing our ideas out of the gate as to whether they're worth developing in the first place, those are the things we're looking for. Because again, we don't want to fall into that fast food category of just like it came in and it was funny, but it's ultimately meaningless. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, for example, with mustard, Cat wanted to explore uh, whimsy and magic because right now we're living in a very logical world. The idea of uh, it's you know it's a very like facts, figures, logic, numbers world. Whereas imaginary friends are the complete polar opposite of that. They're very silly. His name is Mustard, and he's dressed in bright colors. But that alone isn't enough, really. We wanted to find the, the deeper heart of that because I, I agree with you entirely. It's very easy to just pump out content, and it's very easy to fall into that trance of just well, you know it's like when you put on a TV channel and just whatever's on just bombards you. You walk away feeling nothing, remembering nothing. We don't want to be forgotten. Uh, we don't want our stuff to, to pass through you. And so as a result, yes, we always look for kind of what's the beating heart of the idea. Because the idea itself isn't, isn't good enough. There needs to be some extra spin on it. So with Liver, uh, he was a play about addiction and various forms of addiction. Uh, he was an alcoholic. The character was an alcoholic. But he was also addicted to people. He was addicted to trying to find the next person who could complete him. Um, and so, well, we had a very sort of whimsical setup of like, oh man, a guy wakes up on a slab, what's going to happen? There was a real beating heart to that character, and then we sort of went and found, generally one of the things we start with with any character is trying to figure out what their beating heart is going to be. And we've cut characters because they didn't have that, or we've reduced their role to just sort of a, you serve a necessary function, but get out of the way so the characters who we're really connected to um, have their say. So, uh, I, I know it's sort of a rambling question, but I hope that... Somehow, <laughs> it's process, right? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, we. Um, I mean, there are things that we care about a lot, yeah. and those are the kinds of ideas that we want to espouse on stage. And there's, there's, there's questions that we want to explore, particularly for people our age. I mean, delicacy was about marriage and about, uh, at, at you know, in your late twenties, early thirties. And over the course of that show's production, we had people on the team get married, get divorced, fall in love, there were every, every various permutation of relationship. But those were the issues that we were thinking of. With Mustard, part of what we were dealing with is aging parents and realizing, and growing up, and realizing what, basically coming to an understanding of your parents that you do as you get older, that they are people and that they have struggles. I mean, Ty's relationship with Sadie is very, very complicated in, in Mustard. And part of it's that she's shifting gears from being a kid whose mom is just this authoritarian figure who's around to understanding what her mom is actually going through and what, what it means to her as a person, which is something we're thinking about all the time. So um, yeah, we always try and find something that really excites us, that we care about, because we also don't want to throw, as sort of the keepers of the keys, we don't want to put ideas up on stage that we can't stand behind. Even if their are ideas where we want to discuss this thing, we don't agree with it, but we want to discuss it, uh, I think it's very dangerous, and very easy in art to accidentally Trojan horse ideas and, and meaning in, and we've got to be real careful about stereotypes are a great example of that, where it's very easy to just jump to a stereotype character, whether it's you know the nerdy scientist or what have you, and that's just how kids are going to think about scientists for the rest of their life, uh, which is something I deal with in young people's theater a lot. Humor. Mm -hmm. What kind, how often, is it relevant? 
uh, all that the can, time. That can take you a long way or kill you. Yeah, well, our, our goal is, I mean, ultimately all dramas should be funny and all comedies should be tragic, right? Um, they are. Yeah, and so uh, Kat's got a great product mind and we're all horrible pun monsters, so generally speaking, lots of laughs, but if the, if the comedy is detracting from the story, if it's detracting from your experience, then it needs to either be dialed down or reworked, because we never want your brain to leave the room. We want you to stay with our story, stay connected, and if a joke we've made makes your brain kind of go, oh, hang on a second, I don't know if you look that, dialogue and story just continues to roll on and, and missed it. So our goal is to just make, to, as much as possible, whether it's with the comedy, the tragedy, the swear, anything, to make sure that nothing's pulling you out of the play. Not slapstick. Oh, we've got some slapstick. Punch up is a is a mostly slapstick. Uh, we we have to stop because it's two. So, but just before um, you join me in thanking Tom, Tom is coming to the show, so you might be able to catch him and continue the conversation. That's okay. Yeah. Oh, 
dissertation. Well, we need to have some more. Yes, well, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we have control of the sound levels. I'll take that into account today. Not on this one. We do this. We do this. It sounds like this. If you ever need to get it done, I mean, Tara, I mean, Kat was developing a script, but it's a Terra Non-Production, it's directed by a Terra Non-Director.